it's always issue of power. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me here. This talk will be a little bit of an outlier, but it, hopefully you'll see how uh, that it dovetails very well with, uh, with uh, Dr. Nielsen and Dr. Horn were presenting earlier. In fact, the one thing I would like you to take away from here is that evidence, as important as it is, is not enough. It's not enough to know that something worked or it didn't work. We need to know why. Because if we don't, we don't know what to change and how to redesign it, how to make it better. And so this is the main point of this talk, and I get into some details. I'm not going to show any data. This is the team, and uh, normally this, talk, uh, this presentation will be probably given by Andrea Parker, who reads this disc disparity program, but she's uh, working on a more important deliverable. <laughs> she has a little baby that... <laughs> um, the, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is show you some slides very quickly since you've seen m many of them about the um, issues underlying underserved populations and how mobi mobile technology and why mobile technology may make difference, but then I focus on behaviors and what I call behavior informatics that I think is going to be at the heart of a lot of the changes that we'll see in the next 10 years. And finally, um, I'm going to also include plea for real quantitative approaches to understanding what it takes to make behavior change and understand behaviors. So. Um, Priority populations are defined, uh, and it's important to think about that. Um, and so are the health-related issues of underserved populations. But you heard a lot of that from previous speakers, so I'm not going to talk about that. Few examples of kind of issues that uh, are facing the underserved population are, for example, one of the hugest differences is in H HIV infection, where the factor is almost 10 to 1 between uh, African American and, um, and, uh, and the Caucasian populations. Uh, there is some decrease, but not enough in these years. Another is uh, admissions for uncontrolled diabetes. Again, fairly high difference between different populations, and again, it's related to behavior. So I'm trying to convince you that behaviors are one of the key issues that we need to address. Um, Americans uh, who receive mental health treatments or counseling. Again, huge differences this time. It's the Hispanic population that seems to be more affected. And we can talk about why that might be. One of the things that we often don't talk about is the stress that's uh, due to disparities. And that's a stress is a huge determinant of health and how well we're doing. And, um, being in disadvantaged population often uh, results in continuous and high stress. And again, if we could address that, it's re related to behaviors and to behavior change. Now, th this disadvantaged populations are not the only ones that face it. Everyone is facing behavioral problems. In fact, <laughs> my friends say behaviors are killing us. If you look at the at the um, uh, results of uh, McGinnis, uh, 2003, I think, 2001 paper that was recently re uh, uh, redone in 2007, there is only 30% of premature mortality that we cannot do anything about. That's the genetic. Otherwise, there are a lot of things we can do, and behavior accounts for 40% and probably more for, regular, for uh, everybody. Now, uh, these are some of the examples of, uh, of uh, health-related behaviors, and the problem is that behaviors are hard to change. <laughs> and what you need is some sort of just-in-time uh, in in intervention to actually alert you to what you really want to do is go to the fountain to abuse. And this is our uh, re rendering of it this morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And uh, I don't have to go, I will not go through these, except that in addition to standard things like safe sex and, and uh, alcohol and drug smoking, or sedentary, which I don't have here except the exercise, sleep is very important as well. Stress and sleep are not well represented, and especially in underserved populations. These, these have not been addressed and will need to be addressed. Um, this is the big picture that I like to uh, us to think about it. Human at the center, and human has behaves and has states, health states. We don't, we cannot perceive those. We can only sense them. Sensing is the first step. The sens sensing may include questionnaires and other uh, access to information about the person. But then you need to actually build a or identify the relationship between what you're measuring and what you want to know about. So even clinicians who measure blood pressure are not really interested in blood pressure, but they are interested in what it, what it signifies, the health of the cardiovascular system. And for that, we need to have some way of transforming what we measure to uh, what, what actually we want to know. And then if we know that, then we can close the loop and intervene in an optimal way. And so this is the, uh, this is the key of, the, of, the, of my presentation and my trust of work that I want to talk about. This is an example of what you need to know if you want to do behavioral control of weight. You, have, you need to know about the, be, the, you need to understand the behavior. You need to understand what the results of behavior implications are on the energy balance and therefore on the physiology and only then you can build intervention. Now this looks like a block diagram, but the intervention doesn't necessarily have to be mechanical, but it could be uh, a combination of human and machines. And this is what is likely to be very effective. Our collaborator Holly Jimison is working on, on that, trying to get machine do what they do well and then introduce humans to help people to interpret and deal with the machine issues. Now, of course, mobile health, and I'm going to skip through this very quickly because uh, we heard so much about it from Wendy and, and Dr. Horn. Uh, there is a proliferation of, uh, of uh, mobile uh, technology, and what's interesting and important here is that pro proliferation of uh, technology, mobile technology in the underserved population is higher than in the rest of the population. And this is a picture from Africa, and I, ha I have some personal experiences of that. These are the kind of things that people do with, uh, with mobile technology. And uh, one thing that's not here is, uh, that's actually prevalent, not in aging, but in, in younger population, is uh, using telephone to pretend that you're talking to somebody. <laughs> to <us. laughs> This is a picture of what, uh, what we see the both mobile technology on the uh, sensing and intervention side. And these are some examples. And the reason I we brought this is that when you do medical intervention, you actually need FDA approval. And FDA, FDA is now working very actively on making sure that they don't stand in the way of innovation, but at the same time protect uh, the uh, patient. And uh, this is uh, another application that's very nice uh, in uh, uh, glucose monitoring. Um, mobile application, mo mobile phones are used as uh, display devices. And here is ecological momentary assessment that Wendy mentioned. It's a way to ask people about their state and mood and etc. when it's important. So the mobile device senses the state of or the context, and then initiates the question at the time that's important. And the same thing is true about ad adherence and reminders. You don't want to remind people when they are on the phone or sleeping about taking medications or when they are not near the medication uh, dispenser. Um, so here is my main point. It's not enough to know that something that you de develop works or doesn't. We need to know why. 
And uh, I like this uh, uh, quote by Kurt Lewin, that there is nothing more practical than a good theory. And we often lack that, okay? It's very important because the theory is going to not only drive your design, but also questions that you ask. And when you find that your theory is wrong, that's learning, and that helps us go moving forward. And I'm not going to go through the uh, wonderful functions. I'm using the neuro, uh, neuroscience kind of te uh, terminology of afferent and efferent functions. The point is, mobile technology can do a lot, and we're just scratching the surface of what they will do. This is my diagram about uh, uh, the uh, uh, control system that actually is used for optimized intervention. And I want to just give you very quickly at the end an example of work that we were, uh, that uh, started with uh, a brilliant Barney uh, Spring, who ran mobile technology experiments to see if the, she can change people's behavior and change people's weight. And the way we try to model it and give computational model is to use the type one and type two processes rather than the more complex uh, trans-theoretical models or, or cognitive behavior uh, therapeutic models. Um, there are these two processes, and uh, let me, rather than go to details, I'll show you an example. My talk was originally scheduled close to the lunch, and what you see is that your body, you immediate reaction to the right picture is much stronger, much faster. <laughs> and if I put those french fries in front of your that, that, that hamburger, you would grab for it. And now the, let, uh, the left picture is much harder to interpret. You need cognition, you need literacy, right? Even though it's actually more important, right? So this is, these are results of, of Bani's uh, experiments. The first three weeks on uh, are intervention, and intervention is shown on the top. And then there were two groups, randomized control trial. People in uh, the red uh, dotted line represents folks that get traditional uh, intervention in terms of weight control. And uh, the folks in the blue got the, um, got the mobile technology during the intervention. They kept the mobile technology but you can see that when the intervention stopped, there is slow return to their weight, okay? And this is something that very, very important about behaviors, we, the maintenance, right? So now what we do is model this and build uh, these, two, uh, these two process models to characterize this average performance. And once you have a model, then you can develop the, the uh, most optimal intervention that actually maintains the weight. Okay, so um, we have not yet done it, but uh, in the future we experiments we're trying to develop. The now, you would say, this is great, Pavel solved it, we can go home. This is actually not, this is completely wrong, why? Well, here is uh, looking at more individualized groups, peop patients, or, or individuals. The ones on the bottom, on the blue, solid line are the adherers. Those are the folks for whom this worked. The ones in the dotted blue line are the non-adherers. They got the mobile technology too. Not enough to give people technology and not enough to know that it works on the average because we want to intervene with individual people. And so what we need to do is model individuals and be able to predict what they will do and not the average population. And in fact, I would, be, I would bet you that you find, if you go back to even randomized control trials, that you won't find some population for whom many, many interventions worked well and others that didn't. So the take home message is reduction in disparities, but also improvement in health in general is going to benefit greatly from sensor and mobile technology. I didn't talk about big data analytics, but it was implemented in implicit, semi-automated coaching and restructuring structural um, of interventions so to, as to optimize it. And another important point is you have to build these models for individuals. And we only scratching the surface. <laughs>